It gives me great pleasure to introduce our new, next speaker. Uh, we've known Tony here for a long time, over 10 years. He's been a member. Uh, as the saying goes, he was knee-high to a grasshopper when he showed up, and he's kind of gotten taller. Um, and uh, uh, he's going to tell us what he did during one of his uh, summer vacations. So take it away, Tony. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You know, I've been through a lot of these meetings. How long have I been here? Wait. Well, I'm getting really old, basically, but I've uh, been here for a while, and it's really great to give a presentation at the Home Revive Club. Second one, but okay. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, some work I did not this summer when I was working at Suitable, but the summer before it, where uh, I worked on getting uh, coffee with the robot. And uh, it's kind of funny because I was an intern and I basically put interns out of a job. So uh, basically a little bit about what we're going to talk about. I'm going to give you some general background on like the lab, the robot. I think most of you know about the robot, so I can kind of skim that. And then I'm really going to take you through each step of the coffee grasping problem, which is actually a sort of a, a complicated problem. It sounds very specific, but it's actually a very general robotics problem. And then I'm going to talk to you about some lessons learned and sort of pontificate about what the future is based on this. Um, oh, oh, can you press down instead of up? Okay, so just so you know, I'm working currently in the uh, Salisbury Robotics Lab, which mainly is a medical robotics lab and a haptics lab. A lot of our work relates to like, uh, you know, uh, like uh, intuitive surgical and some of the other big medical things come out of there. Uh, and uh, so a lot of our stuff's like that stuff, but we also have done personal robotics. And so uh, there's sort of this sort of nice little loop that I've got going for you with the uh, PR2. Uh, basically, there are two grad students in the, uh, the lab that made the PR1, which is on the left there. Um, and PR1 was pretty cool, and Scott thought it was cool, so that spun out into Willow Garage and became the primary focus of Willow Garage for the past five years. Uh, so, uh, just a couple of facts about the PR2, which you, you may or may not know. Um, that puppy costs uh, four hundred thousand um, dollars, and it weighs four hundred pounds. So when you see that guy coming at you, kind of get out of the way. Um, there's also more battery capacity on an energy density basis in our robot than in a Prius. Um, and so we have a lot of sensors to play with. We have like, two laser scanners, many color cameras, uh, connect like depth cameras, and actual connects, two arms, etc. Um, and despite this, it's still largely human safe. Um, it's not, it's surprisingly non-frightening uh, when it's around you. Um, you. You don't kind of run away from it like you do with most other robots. Um, and so the PR2 is like a sort of kitchen sink, everything in there, to really determine what is needed. And it's exclusively for research purposes. You're, you're not going to use this in your daily life. Um, and of course, we, we've You've all heard tonight about ROS. You've seen it on uh, Homebrew Robots uh, in the club. ROS is really developed for the PR2. And um, it was developed with the PR2 in mind. Um, and, uh, you know, ROS, as you may know, contains all this software that we use, uh, just all this research software sort of shoved in there that we can use. Uh, and, you know, we use some of that, and I'll talk about that during the talk. Okay, so here's the basics of the task. Um, I don't know if, you, if you've been to Clark Center, you might have been on Stanford. Um, that's where our lab is located. Our lab is located on the first floor of the building. And on the third floor is the Pete's Coffee Shop that is the, uh, the target of this operation. Um, and along the way, there, there's two main obstacles, which is these very nasty spring-loaded doors that uh, they're just really hard to open, um, and the elevator. And so we had to bust both of those. Uh, and we'll talk about that. So, you know, 
the whole like concept, just so you know, like you, you all, basically everyone here wants to do personal robotics, but in academia, personal robotics is generally the term for the stuff we're interested in, like household robotics and personal assistance, and uh, instead of like, you know, aerial robotics or industrial robotics. Uh, and uh, sort of like my whole approach to robotics is sort of just to, to sort of, you know, use your, your human intuition to resolve the problem. Instead of developing like this brilliant AI system to solve every problem, we just kind of use our human intuition to sort of work around the problems individually. Um, and you'll see that a lot in my talk, how we did that. Uh, it's just sort of built from the ground up instead of from the top down. Um, and the coffee bot is really a demonstration of this approach. Uh, so a couple of important qualifications for this talk and why this is a hard problem. Uh, we decided that the robot must be fully autonomous. Uh, obviously not fully autonomous robots. You're starting to ask why not just hire someone to get the coffee for 10 bucks an hour. <laughs> uh, and the environment must be completely unmodified. It's, uh, it's a major political um, and social problem to put like markers in the environment or especially to mess around with the elevator. Uh, there have been problems even with putting like Wi-Fi access points in elevators from like, you know, like a safety standpoint or whatever. So we can't modify the uh, environment. It sort of defeats the purpose anyway. Okay, so I'm going to show you some basic navigation stuff with the robot and then explain how Ross navigation works and how we had to modify it. So this is just, let me skip to this because this part's a little boring. So this is just after the robot picked up the money. It's in our lab right now, we're driving around. You can see the robot sort of avoiding all these obstacles like the, uh, the wall. You, then you have this person who walks in and gets in the way. And so, I mean, in fairness, the robot got in her way too. They, they had to put up with a lot of stuff while we were doing this project. Um, so yeah, so it avoided the person and uh, went back to the door. And we'll talk about the door in a bit, but we're going to talk first about how the navigation works. Um, so the sensors that are used are two main sensors. One is the wheel odometry, um, and the wheel odometry is discrete integration, but it's really accurate. So it's very accurate over short distances, and as you go more and more, especially with rotation, you get air just builds up, and eventually that air term explodes and kills the, uh, kills the effectiveness of the sensing. Um, the laser scanner accurately measures distance to objects, but it doesn't do any good for telling you where you are in and of itself, because it just accurately measures distance. Um, and so there's software that's been developed in the robotics community for a long time, and you know the, one of the brilliant things about Ross that makes this available, which is uh, SLAM, the Simultaneous Localization and Mapping System. Uh, and the basic idea of SLAM is you basically just drive the robot around with a, uh, a video game controller, running the software, the laser spinning, the odometry is calculating its uh, approximate position as well as it can, and at the end of driving through the building, you end up with a map of it. Um, and this is like a 2D map of the building. And this generally works really good unless you have um, very open spaces that don't contain any objects. Then you start having problems. Um, and once you're done with making the maps, you then can use just lo straight up localization, no mapping, to drive around on the maps. And localization is really good. Uh, it's pretty tolerant, actually, of like changes in the map. And the way it works, it just it takes the uh, the approximate position of the robot from odometry, and it takes the laser scan and the map, and it tries to simulate what the laser scan should look like for a cloud of possible positions around where the robot is or was last seen, and then it figures out which of those positions is the right one, and then uh, it. it picks the highest probability one, it just keeps doing that over and over and over again. Sort of this whole cloud, it's, it's very, uh, it's, <coughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, 
The other thing that we do while we're operating is we have this dynamic cost map grid overlaid over top of the map. And that cost map grid is for storing dynamic obstacles. So uh, the blue obstacles, I believe, are dynamic obstacles in the map. Basically, when someone walks in front of the robot, create a blue a dynamic obstacle, then we inflate it, and that allows us to just use algorithms from video game planning to avoid uh, getting stuck on the obstacle. Uh, in addition to those uh, mapping algorithms, in addition to that, we also do ray tracing. So when we see a target with the laser, we sort of sweep out all the cost map in front of it. So if you put something in front of the robot and then take it away, it'll just it'll clear that obstacle out. And uh, it works pretty good. It takes a couple of cost map updates to really clear the map, but it does a pretty good job. Also, if the robot can't get to its goal, it gets stuck, like it's, there's no way it's getting to the goal, it stops and deletes all the dynamic obstacles and then starts again. Sometimes you don't clear obstacles and then you get stuck. So it's a, it's a sort of a, a backup update routine. Now, all this stuff came with ROS, so when you actually install ROS, you're getting this stuff. And uh, yeah, now the problem with it though is we have a multi-story building, and we also have a building that's really big. Like the building is about the size of this, this building, and one of the problems with SLAM is we can't really restart SLAM. So it was very hard to make like a huge map of the whole building, like you actually almost run out of battery in the robot thinking. So what we did is we developed a system called multi-map navigation, which lets you stick together multiple 2D maps with wormholes between them. And the nature of wormholes is varied. Uh, some of the wormholes are just points that you drive to and then you're in the next map. And some of them actually require actions to be executed at them such as the doors and the elevator are all wormholes. And there are actually, I believe, seven maps in the system. Um, like the inside of the building and the outside and a couple more to make it up to the elevator. And you'll see this in the video. You'll see like every time it transitions, that's another map. Okay, so now that we talk about navigation, we're gonna talk about how we dealt with doors. And the basic idea is just to consider so far, the navigation sort of knows, we have like sort of, some metadata that lets us know where the doors are in the map. So we can just drive to the X, Y position of the doors and then switch over to the custom door controller. So the, the issue is there's two ways to open the doors and this is pushing the doors open. Okay, what? So you can see the robot sort of lined up on the door. It's lining up with the laser and then <clears throat> it spins around and back through the door. Um, and this is the project, we originally were hitting the doors at like 0.5 meters per second, which led to the concept of door blasting as the term for this, because it's actually sort of scary. Okay. So a little more detail on how the lineup works. Um, basically, so the first part is they're transparent. So the default door detector in Ross, like the stuff that we used in Milestone 2 at Willow, is to look for the recessed door. If you have like a, a, like say a bathroom door, like in your house, it's sort of recessed into the door frame. So a lot of the way it works is by looking for the recessed door. That doesn't work because the doors are just holes and a sort of thing around them. Uh, and they're also really heavy. So the robot cannot put, it can't use its arm to manipulate the doors. They're just too heavy for the robot. Um, and so, uh, so, yeah, so we're within like 12, I would estimate 30 centimeters at worst. We're probably within more like 10 centimeters when we drop out of navigation. Uh, and so the first step is to actually line up distance-wise with the door, because you could be forward or backwards with the door. Uh, and then to line up rotationally with the door. Rotation generally tends to be the most critical axis to get right, because small, off, small errors in rotation get magnified as you drive, even if you drive straight, it's gonna magnify small errors in rotation. Uh, and then, once we're done that, uh, we then can slide side to side by making the central window, the window in the door, line up center with the robot. 
and that allows the robot to line up side to side. So there, that basically gets you all three axes. Um, and then the spinning and backing through the door is a pre-programmed script, which is a little bit of a problem because the robot doesn't have any sensors on the back. So if someone jumps in front, it's just going to run them down. <laughs> uh, so that's one of the problems. Okay, so, so now I'm going to show you how we do door pulling. And so I sped up 20x the driving along the building because it's kind of boring, but it does show you what it's like, how far the robot actually had to travel. <laughs> what is that? Um, I don't know. It's long enough that it's annoying to walk in. I don't really know off the top of my head, but you can go on Google Maps if you're curious and figure it out. Okay, so. Um, the first part of this is to mechanically align with the door. So you see the robot's driving forward and it does a sort of like waggle dance to line up flush with the door. And now it's using, it's mechanically feeling the distance of the door and now it's sliding its hand sideways across the door to detect the handle. And now it's hit the handle. So it's just going to move over a fixed distance and it can grab the handle. And once it grabs the handle, it uses, it can cancel out the position of the handle and then do this sort of elaborate dance to get through the door. <laughs> Thank you. And there we go. Um, so, one fun thing is that the detection of the handle, I should explain a bit of why detection of the handle was such a problem. Um, the handle, you can't detect handles on transparent doors. There's a lot of work that's been done on door handle detection with uh, CV. It's actually pretty nice when you have like a, a solid door, because those doors, like especially the ones at Willow Garage, were just monochrome and the handle was silver. So it's very nice to just detect the handle. Um, but in this situation, the window reflects the handle, so there's actually two handles, one on the door and one which is the real one. Um, and uh, the handle itself is a problem because it's shiny, it's completely reflective in this case. So first of all, its coloration is random, it depends on what's behind the robot. Which could be if there's like a guy in a red shirt, then it'll be red, if there's a guy with a blue shirt, it'll be blue. The other thing is that depending on the angle of the sun, the dominant lines are not the actual sides of the handle, but the specular highlights. Basically like the shininess of the handle. And so if you do that, the lines on the handle are random. So you can't do any edge detection because it's random. Um, so basically it's just like this really awful, unpredictable thing. But of course one feature about door handles is that they don't they're solid. So you can just slide your hand across the door until you hit the handle, and it works really good. I've never seen it fail. <laughs> uh, and one thing is, I do want to mention the sort of waggle dance that we do. I kind of didn't emphasize that enough, but that's a very common maneuver that you'll see throughout, especially in the elevator, to get lined up in the elevator. Because if the robot's like a little bit off on rotation, it can completely miss the target. But if it's lined up, it won't miss. Um, okay, now the elevator. So, yeah, let's watch the elevator video, because the elevators are fun. So, now, the other issue is you can see these people are having like this really boring meeting, and so they're actually complaining about the robot, and I'm just like, I'm doing my research, deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> And they were just laughing because they don't, you know, do you want to sit there and listen to someone talk about it or do you want to watch the robot? Yeah. Um, and so this is actually one that you use the computer vision, which is to look for the elevator button. Um, and the elevator took too long. We give it a 30 second uh, timeout, but it turns out the elevator took like 35 seconds to show up, so the robot just said, screw it, we're going to push the button again, and it missed the elevator. <laughs> and then it did it again. Now, it actually took 30 seconds, but I cut the video because like, you just don't want to see the robot staring at the wall for 30 seconds. Kind of boring. 
Okay, now one of the other things is that we have to be very careful to not run anyone over on getting into the elevator. We also have to move very fast to get in the door before it shut. So now the robot's in the elevator and it's lining up. Someone pushed the button on the elevator. The robot's lining up in the elevator and now it's lined up, so it's going to push the elevator button. And that's floor three. So now the robot has to wait for the door to open. Which actually, um, okay. And now, this is another problem, is ensuring the correct floor, which I'll talk about more. Um, but you have to do that because there's two floors, and if you're going up, you could, you could accidentally get out at floor two instead of floor three, and then you'd be stuck. Um, and then here's another door, so I'll kill it before we do that. Okay. So, as you see, there's, there's steps of like get in the elevator, push the call buttons, get out of the elevator. Um, so, getting in the elevator, uh, the first step is pressing the little call button. Uh, and so, uh, PR2 knows the approximate location of the elevator buttons due to the map again. Drop on navigation with, you know, 10 centimeter accuracy at minimum. Uh, and so the first step is to use the laser scanner, just line up with the wall straight and at the right distance. And then we hold the hand and there's a camera in the arm about here. And we just use open CV up circles to look for the button. And I messed around with parameters until I got it right. But you know, you just look for the button because it's a circle and hub circles don't care about anything but circles. Um, and uh, we just kind of had the robot sweep side to side till it found the button. You with the arm. Once it's lined up, you can just push the button and you're done with a free program script. Um, so the next step is to wait for the elevator to rise. Now if you're aware, elevators have the little lights that let you know when the elevator's there and which way it's going. Uh, so we just had the robot back up and actually it just stands in the same place after pushing the button and looks up. The, the buttons are a fixed coordinate on the image, so we just have that coordinate programmed in. And if the pixel there is pure white, because the buttons saturate the cameras, or the, the lights saturate the cameras, then we consider it a hit, and we consider it to come. And we only, there's two elevators, so we need to make sure we get the right one. Because as soon as we see that one, start making our way to the door, because the door shuts fast. Uh, you don't realize how fast it shuts until you try to get the robot in before chess. Uh, and uh, uh, so you also want to make sure you get in the right way. You don't want to go on a down go up on a down elevator. Um, and so one of the other things is once you drive into the elevator, you don't want to ride in elevators with people because the robot basically haunts the whole elevator. Uh, so it's really scary. So you just made the robot check to make sure the elevator is square before going in. Um, are those, um, um, what are those things that he's sitting with? Oh, the mics? Oh, those are like audio amplifiers, so the, the voice, this thing works. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, so, um, once you get in the elevator, uh, once you get in the elevator, you need to make sure you're right. So once you get in the elevator, you need to find the buttons. Um, and so one of the nice things about elevators is that the buttons, people don't really come in and move the buttons around in elevators. So, or we, and the other problem is, the other problem you mentioned is that the elevator is completely shiny. Uh, I thought the elevator was gonna be a great place to use computer vision because the elevator is a fixed lighting environment. Like there's no lighting changes. But it turns out the entire elevator is one giant mirror. So as we talked about previously, the edges of the elevator are random, depending on your perspective with respect to the lights. So it's really hard to do computer vision in the elevator. Like, I think, oh, the buttons are the same as the ones outside, we'll just use the hub circles. No, all garbage. Um, but the elevator has really nice edges. So we just line up on the edges, hit the buttons, and we're done. Uh, as soon as you gotta do that, you gotta run really fast to the front door of the elevator to make sure you get out in time so that you don't get stuck. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> okay, now exiting the elevator is really easy 
tell when the door is open because you just wait for the laser scanner in front to be clear. Um, it's also important, so now the other thing is to check the exit sign. So the way we initially did the exit sign, and this is the published method in the paper, is we look to the left and there's a, uh, there's, or to the right, and there's a little, uh, sorry, there's a little thing on the wall, which is the sign. So we had some open CV transforms to sort of extract that image out to a 64 pixel by 64 pixel image and threshold it. You can see it in B in all of its glory. That's one of the elevator signs. And then we did, we had three of them. We had uh, three of them stored on disk, uh, one for each floor. And we just did a, um, a compare. Uh, basically just did like a, le a subtract, like a least squares, sort of a, just we got the, the standard deviation between the two of them basically. And once we found the standard deviation, we just found the one with the lowest standard deviation. Here now, it worked really good until the sun set. And then the lighting was wrong and it stopped working. So, uh, Professor Salzer right, and all of his genius realized that there's an accelerometer in the robot and elevators accelerate. So we deleted this garbage and replaced it with an accelerometer based detector. And the accelerometer based system works really good. And I recommend that in all future elevator detection, we just use the accelerometer because it doesn't mess up. Um, so we know what floor we started on, and we know when the elevator started moving, and we know when the elevator stopped moving. And since the elevator sort of moves at a constant velocity, we know the time. I tried just doing like discrete integration on the accelerometer data, but it's too noisy. So basically I just said, okay, if we have more than three events over a certain threshold, we started, and if we have more than three below a certain threshold, we stop. Um, so now, driving, and also this is the only thing that failed in the integrated system, was this. Um, it failed, we were, had like a perfect run going, and the second to last thing the robot did, which is exit the elevator and get back to our floor, it got stuck and it couldn't see. It thought it was on floor two instead of floor one, and it kept repeating and repeating and repeating, and we gave up. Okay. Um, Driving to the coffee shop. Okay, now, now that we dealt with the elevator, I'm talking about how we got around in the coffee shop. So you can see the robot had to get through more doors. There's a total of five doors between the lab and the coffee shop. They're all the same. Uh, yeah, they're all identical, which was lucky, because I didn't want to have to write two door openers. And you can see how it's reflective um, in the door with the handles and stuff. Okay, so now we're waiting in line at the coffee shop, which is a problem that I'll, I'll explain. Basically, there we found that lines uh, in this coffee shop always form in a certain region. So as the robot drive through that region, and if anything got in the way of the laser scanner, it would just stop and wait. And unfortunately, in this video, there is no line at the coffee shop, because otherwise the robot actually did a really good job of waiting in line. It's kind of a shame that we don't have a good video of that. Now the robot is giving money to the person. <laughs> and now we're taking the coffee cup. And there's also a, a, a custom Tony Trackhands modification of the PR2, which you can see on the back. <laughs> There's actually two. The uh, the black piece is the anti-bureaucrat bumper, which is designed to make it less scary to people that the that the robot is dashing into all the doors. Uh, okay, so back to the top. Uh, you saw I basically explained how the robot drives a predefined course. Uh, and one of the problems is I realized like I went to like way weeks after this, and I realized that a lot of the lines in most restaurants are random. So while it's nice that the line in um, in uh, the coffee shop forms in a certain way, the line in like McDonald's doesn't do that. 
So in the future, we're going to have to come up with a more generic approach to waiting in line. Uh, that's a problem that we I have not read any research on. Um, okay, so the ordering the, the, the coffee, the way we order the coffee is we could have text the speech to the order, but it's really hard to understand. And the person would have been like, what? What do you want? And then the robot would not have had the capacity to repeat it. So instead, we had a handwritten random note style note that we handed. Now in the, the bag is like 10 bucks, and this random style note, only instead of holding people ransom, we're actually buying products from them. Um, that's kind of funny. Um, and so we gave that, and then we took the coffee cup. Now, there has to be, now we can't train the barista. Uh, although they got used to the process eventually. So we had to write our we had to write a system that's intuitive for interacting with the uh, the barista. Okay. Um, so the one thing so I sort of had to intuitively I couldn't find much research on this either. So I basically came with an intuitive approach to doing it. And the idea is that uh, I, I sort of studied how I passed objects to other people. I have no idea if this is a, a psychologically correct explanation, but I'm going to roll with it. Uh, and so there's two main approaches to passing objects to people. One is that the receiver holds out their hand, and then the giver places the object in their hand. Uh, there's also the opposite approach, where the giver holds out the object, and then the receiver grabs it. Um, and so one of the cool things is that we never actually have to do any intelligent grasping of the object because we can just have the humans do all the work of either putting the object into the robot's hand or taking the robot away from the, uh, from the robot. Uh, and so uh, humans are also very good at knowing when to let go of objects that they're holding, which is a very important issue. Um, it's very, it's, very, I have not seen many people pass objects to each other and drop the objects, but I think there's actually a bug in humans where there's one condition that always happens and that leaves the object being dropped. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to reproduce that effectively with people, but um, that's beside the point. Um, and the basic issue is that humans hold on to the object until they feel the other person pull back the object. Which, even if I'm like blindfolded, I don't know how good of a grasp you got on the object I'm handing you. I can feel that you have a good grasp on the object because you pulled the object back and that pulled it out of my hand. That's when I know to let go. Uh, and so, the way we do this, with the, the way we exploitively interact with the person uh, is that we hold out the robot's hand with the, this for giving objects to people. We hold out the robot's hand with the object, and then we, we of course use text to speech to say, please take the object. Uh, and then there's two conditions to decide when to release the object. One is that there's significant hand acceleration, and the other is that the arm has been deflected. So we're not actually holding the arm stiff, we're forcing the human to overcome the motion of the robot. And when the human overcomes the motion, the, the strength of the robot, uh, past a certain point, we let go of the object. Uh, and then once we do that, it's very important to you for the human to pull your arm back and then fold it up. Uh, pulling the arm back lets you know that the lets the person know that it's done. It looks weird if the robot just holds its hand. <laughs> Um, it makes you feel like you stole the object from the robot. It's very bad. Uh, now, the opposite effect of receiving an object from a human, uh, and we started out with a very sim a similar process. We just hold out the empty hand, ask the person to put the, uh, the hand in it, or put the object in the hand, and then grasp the hand, grasp the object when the previous conditions were met, uh, which is the accelerometer or the hand being forced back. Start with these arms, that worked great. But there were problems. This failed because what people would do is let's say that this is the robot's hand, uh, the person would hold the object like this and not actually bump the person's hand. 
um, and not or bump the robot's hand. And that was a problem because it was waiting for it to hold on, so I just sit there and you would be very confused. So we have to come up with an alternative approach to this. Um, and I have to say, remember there's a camera in the robot's forearm looking up. So we, um, what we did is we took that and I found a region of it, sort of a polyhedron in it, that was, or a polygon in it, that corresponded to the region in front of the robot's hand. And what we did is we took a picture of that and then did a standard deviation comparison on the picture. And once we exceeded a certain standard deviation, we grabbed the object. And uh, that was a really uh, interesting solution because it solved it. And by the way, I've been misusing the term standard deviation. Uh, what I really mean to say is we subtracted each pixel in the two images and then squared it and then summed that all up. So it's sort of reminiscent of a standard deviation. I guess you could say it's the Euclidean distance between the two image vectors without the square root. But whatever. That's really what we're doing. Um, so, sorry. I am not an academic. Is that like a dot product? Uh, it's, I guess, well, the dot product of a vector with itself is the Euclidean difference. It's all math. Like, now we're getting pedantic over math terminology. All that matters is like, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Whatever it is, it works. That's what matters. Um, so, despite this, uh, sometimes, so sometimes if you wave your hands in front of the, the ripper, uh, the, the sensor will be tripped because your hand's there and it wasn't there. So that's a problem with like ceiling fans. There's all kinds of junk that goes on in the background that can be a problem. So the robot will just grab and it will miss the object. Um, and so the solution to this is when the gripper closes, we do a test to see if we actually have the object. And if not, we just try the whole thing again. Um, that's also a solution to the problem where, uh, where people don't force the objects all the way into the gripper, so the hand slips off as it's pulling back. It's very important to do the pull back step because that's how the human knows when to let go. Um, and humans will not in the case where the robot's hand slips off, humans will usually not let go of the object. They'll just be like, oh man, it missed. What's it gonna do? Oh, it's just gonna ask me to do it again. Uh, and uh, you can observe the money passing, and uh, so yeah, so anyway, we did this, and uh, you can see the rest of the video now. Here's the rest of the video. Uh, now we finished collecting the coffee. We have the cup holder. So the robot cannot do that. That's one of my recommendations, by the way, for anyone who's building robots, that you need cup holders or something on the robot. Humans can actually stash a lot of objects if we uh, put them under our arms. Sort of a nice little clever thing that we can do. Um, <coughs> I could get the doors and put the back of the You'll see. The cup holder's on the other side of the door, which is one of the like, like things that's not a sustainable approach on this robot. It's also above the bar. Yeah. So that's one of the other things they found out, a nice little life hack, is that uh, the coffee actually doesn't get cold. Now it takes about 20 minutes, I believe, to get back to the lab. Remember, this whole thing took 47 minutes in real time. It's really slow. Uh, there's all those people again. Uh, there's also more traffic, this time a mail cart. Um, the mailman really loved this, I don't know why. Um, but there's there's a lot more traffic this time, and you can see it's also kind of confusing the robot because all the people like run around, and it's also very hard for the robot to do clearing because the wall is transparent. Uh, so yeah. So the coffee doesn't get cold because of the plastic bag. That was the answer to the question I forgot to say. Yeah, if there's any more questions, I can take them while this grows. Yeah. So for you're talking about like you check to see if the elevator is the right angular. Are you just looking like with the laser to see if it's if it the right angular shape? If the door, what? The, the you were talking about how like you check to see the elevator is clear. Yeah. So we're using base laser to detect that. Okay, you're not doing like um, a or any sort of like 
No, what we do is we just scan the door and then there's the Python script knows how the elevator should look and if there are any points in there that aren't a square, uh -huh. we reject. Okay. And so if there's a person in there, someone left a propane tank in there, it was very bad. <laughs> it just rejected it. Oh, here's the, and I'll get to you after we, we watch this. Here's the cup getting deposited. One of the things that really freaked me out was the chair, but the chair got out of the way. Done. Now the robot where the client cuts his arms and the video ends. Okay. What was your question? So did the coffee spill when you the coffee spill? Did it spill? What? Did the coffee spill? Is that your question? Yes. Okay, so the coffee actually didn't spill, but we had the plastic bag so that if we dropped the coffee, we didn't end up killing the $400,000 robot. We just lost the $5 coffee. Uh, generally, it's a good idea to have that. Uh, we actually don't need the plastic bag. We could have done the whole thing without it. I just would have been really freaking out the whole time if we hadn't had the plastic bag. I'm going to be passing microphones around, so... Okay, I got a couple more slides and then we'll okay. do questions. Um, so, the lessons learned from this sort of process, um, it's really fun and exciting to do this kind of stuff. Um, it's really impractical in its current state. I mean, I guess we didn't know. Um, however, it could be useful if you're disabled. I mean, this could be helpful for disabled people, but um, or artistic purposes. I don't know what the artistic purposes of this would be, but, you know, they're there. Uh, and computer vision is really unreliable. Uh, sometimes it can be useful, but in general, it does really weird things, and it's hard to predict what it's going to do, and I would recommend trying to avoid using it. We've well, got laser scanners and connects and whatnot. Um, and the simple heuristic approaches really worked and did their job every time. And you might think that, like, you know, there'll be a case where they won't work, but um, they did their job every time. And I would recommend that instead of doing all this sort of AI stuff, we just sort of build from the ground up with really hacky stuff, and it'll just work in the end. Uh, and the other thing, I guess this is life advice as well, is don't be afraid to fail, and don't be afraid to retry. Uh, it's a really, it's a exponentially harder curve between 90% to 99% to 99.9%. So, you know, if the robot fails 10% of the time and it's hard enough to try again, who cares? Um, it's a robot, it's free. It's more important not to do the engineering time, make it 99% efficient. Uh, the other thing that is important that is not in this talk um, is that you know, if the robot only works 99% of the time, you know, it can call for human help. And with the internet, human help can be right there in less than a second. Okay, so future work. Robotic software keeps getting reinvented uh, to run the same tasks. And in some cases, the wheel is literally reinvented. Now, Ross helped a lot in avoiding this, but Ross has its deficiencies. It's very hard to use, it's very hard to install, uh, it's very hard to configure, and it doesn't help with a lot of the base level configuration that we see, like providing environment definitions, object modeling, a lot of problems it doesn't solve. So I'm working on a, uh, a next generation approach to handling this problem right now uh, called the BLAST, which is sort of this easy to use framework for creating uh, a sustainable approach to writing all the really hacky little programs like open the door. Oh, you have a weird model of refrigerator? Well, you can just write special software to open it and plug it in instead of the default refrigerator opener. Uh, and one of the things is that in our modern world, there's, there's, not, there's a limited set of stuff. So even if we have to manually program the robot to open every single refrigerator, there's only like 10,000 models of refrigerator. There's only 10,000 programs. Each of those takes an hour to write. Okay, that's a lot, but it's not horrible. Okay, now we're finally on to questions. You first, sir. Did you get the correct change? 
Uh, I didn't check because I was more more ecstatic that the robot actually worked and was making sure like the video camera actually recorded the run than uh, cared about that. But I think we did. Did you consider using a tray to put the cups on and the money and, and maybe some sort of a uh, you know, button or response button for you? Know? Um, so in the beer fetching demo at Will Garage, they did trays. And that's sort of more of a hardware concern of the robot. But um, they did trays, but I had to lift the, uh, to really get effective door opening, I had to lower the, the arm, to lower the torso down. Because you know the torso ranks and lowers. And on uh, trays, basically, as far as I understand, there's no way to build a tray when the torso is low. Um, the arm will hit the coffee cup and spill it. How long did it take you to make the robot? Okay, so it was about an eight-week mission of manufacturing the robot, and then there was about two weeks afterwards of like writing the paper and uh, editing stuff and like editing the video. That took a long time. Uh, Tony you was saying that you had a uh, challenge trying to figure out what floor you were on. Did you think about uh, using an altimeter? I did, but I'm not aware if altimeters are that accurate. They are very accurate in airplanes. Okay, I mean if they're accurate enough, I'm happy to use one. I just, uh, I didn't really have one on me at the time, so I just went for the accelerometer. Okay. Um, did you have to train the um, Did you have to train the barista to put the coffee in the? In the no. Um, actually, no, it wasn't. They were great at the coffee shop, by the way. They were like completely happy with it because every time the robot went in there, five people would be following it, and they don't buy coffee. I was like, why are they so happy? And then I realized, like, ten minutes in, oh, that's why. <laughs> Does this robot stay at Stanford? Does this robot stay at Stanford, he asked. The answer is yes. We have the robot in the Salisbury Robotics Lab and we're doing stuff with it. I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> so after you, after, when you're getting it from the you know, 80 to 90 percent reliable point or whatever point you stopped at, you find that the, getting it to that point made it more flexible in terms of its ability to do other other doors or other kinds of elevators or were you actually you know, zooming nope. in on one very, very specific So test. I think the elevator stuff could be reused if you changed it. There's probably about 30 parameters that would have to be adjusted to make it work on a different elevator, but it would probably work really easily. It was kind of designed that way from a coding perspective to let you reuse it, but you know, it, it's still, I mean, it's still going to have to be manually configured for each element. So how, many different doors, how many different doors and elevators do you think you'd have to train it in before you um, feel like it would be, have a I don't think you could ever, ever, I don't think you could ever have a generic system. Because people fail to operate elevators all the time. They recover, but they fail. And people also fail at door opening. I saw a ton of people fail to open the doors. Took a lot. Of, there's like instances where it takes people like three attempts to open the doors successfully. Uh, and so if you know the idea that like the robot's gonna like the idea that there's, I'm trying to dispel the notion that there's like ever gonna be a perfect door opener. Because you make a perfect door opener, I'm gonna come up with a door that makes it not work. And it won't take me long, but I'll, I'll come up with one. Like you know, how about if I spray paint the whole door pink? What's the uh, number one lesson that you uh, learned about reliability, or the number, the top um, three lessons you learned about? You know what? The lesson that I've learned, and I've done this for like, basically, I've learned this from robotics. Is like, if it's not tested, it's broken. Is a a, a creed to live by. So, you know, we had to test. You just test, 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 and do the same thing like three times, and you'll probably make it reliable if it works three times in a row. That's what I set my standard at for reliability. Um, the number one cause, like. The the thing that happens is that the robot is in the same place with respect to the door every time, it's gonna work every time, barring mechanical failure of the robot. So the key is alignment. The key is to get the robot in the same place with respect to the object every time. So like the DARPA thing, like that you saw, I don't wanna say that that would be easy, but it would be easier if you managed to get the robot in the same place with respect to the with respect to the car every time, I'll bet you it would work every time. But the problem is getting the robot in the same place with respect to the car every time, is hard. And there's noise in every sensor along the way. The lowest noise sensor, and therefore the best, is, is touch. 
If you grab onto the car, you know where the car is. Okay. Uh, Tony, uh, a great job there actually. So, a good question. Uh, what is the processing power of this PR2? Uh, so, the processing power on the PR2 is like 2 quad 4 xenons or something ridiculous like that. But we didn't actually use a lot of that processing power. I think a lot of that stuff is excessive. Uh, you probably could get away, not with a beagle board, but with something way less than we had. And that's one of the issues that, uh, that's one of the power drain issues actually, is all that stuff. Okay, this is because uh, you are not using the, all the algorithms. You are just no, the we, we just like, there's no really high CPU stuff in there. The highest CPU stuff in there was like image comparison. Did you have any problems with people getting into the elevator after the um, robot? Yes, yeah, but no, because I kicked them out. <laughs> um, and we were going to mount, if, we probably wouldn't have that because we were going to mount a sign on the robot saying stay out of the elevator. Uh, in audio, like there's ways to prevent that, like in audio alert being like dang, 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 on their robot would probably prevent that. Uh, generally just annoy people enough that they will go away. <laughs> that would work on the lines as well. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really, I liked it when the robot, so that's actually, can I say something about waiting in line that's really funny, is the robot would wait in line, and you can't hear, so the robot makes a lot of noise because it's got like a fan, you can just hear fan constantly from the robot as well as the motors, and it's just like constant CPU fan noise. The coffee shop happens to be just loud enough with like the music and the din of the coffee shop that you can't hear the robot. So if you would be just like waiting in line, people who wait in line are usually like all absent-minded, the robot would just roll up behind them and they just keep walking in line. And they'd be in there for like four or five minutes, and then they buy their coffee. They pay and then they turn around and the robot would be standing there. And they'd be like, oh my god, what? <laughs> and there's this great video of this guy like her, he's just like, this is like, I'm like, okay, okay, thank you, and then, whoa! <laughs> 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 hey, so, if you get uh, lost, let's say, the uh, second floor instead of, uh, re recover, auto recover? Uh, <laughs> no, it'd be screwed. So, that, that's basically like, if you get on the second floor and you think you're on the third floor, it's over. Uh, what would generally happen, hope, what would actually happen is because of the similarity between the second floor and the third floor, it would go into the office next door and get stuck on the wall thinking that it, that was the line. Uh, it may also actually drive around and pretend there's a coffee shop counter there, which would be really funny. Uh, but yeah, the hope is that after 30 seconds of waiting or whatever, you call a human for assistance. And when that happened, it would be, you know, you'd say, uh, oh, I don't think this is a coffee shop, and help the robot. Uh, it seems from your takeaways that you're saying that, um, for instance, be better technology, faster processors, or whatever, would not solve these problems. Right? No, I don't, I don't think it will. I think the only way, the only way to solve these problems is to recreate, to solve these problems sustainably, if you consider humans to have sustained like a sustainable solution to it, is to recreate a human. And if you do that, you're going to get all the benefits of being human and all the problems of being human. So you're basically not going to do any good. Um, you might as well just bioengineer yourself to be immortal and then you're done, instead of bothering with that. <laughs> Did you consider uh, somebody stealing the coffee after? Um, yeah, I did, but the robot would have caught them on camera and I would have beat them up too. So I was standing there. <laughs> Were there any handicap accessible power doors in this path where it could have just push the button? Um, there was one, but there was not all of them. Um, and the other issue with the handicap issue power door is we may have pushed the button, but it may have actually taken too long to drive through the door. Like, the door only stays open for so long. Um, I didn't work on that because I already had the door opener, and it was taking way too long, but could have done it. Presumably, uh, localization is running all the time. That the yeah, localization is running all the time. Does that use very much CPU? 
not really. Uh, it's a low intensity process because it's just basically like a compare. It's basically a thousand laser scan map comparisons uh, at 30 hertz, which sounds like a lot, but it's tri all the stuff is trivial compared to like Starcraft. Uh, and the other thing about localization I should mention is localization. When the robot exits the door, we reset localization, and when it exits the elevator, we reset localization. So localization would drift around if it got messed up, it just get reset. Because when it went in the elevator, it completely screwed localization because the elevator is like not on the map. In what instances uh, are the is the robot like dangerous? I saw like opening the door that. Uh, that so scary. the instances where the robot, all of them, no. Uh, so the robot is inherently dangerous because if there was a bug in the software and the robot took off like a bat out of hell, uh, you would be crushed by the robot. And if no one was there to push the e stop, you would be crushed by the robot. Now I was pounds. always there with e stop. I made like an e stop necklace, so I had like this like very fashionable duct tape and fishing wire e stop necklace on me at all times to stop the robot. Uh, it's very fashionable. It's going to be a fashion trend next year. I guarantee it. Uh, the the uh, the, uh, the problem with with uh, the problem with that is that like ju it's just a de facto design the robot um, that makes it so scary. There are a few situations where the robot's backing up that it has to and not it can't see behind it, and so that's something I, I wish we could get rid of, but um, can't really do anything about. It. Uh, there's also, when the robot drives through the door, I believe I put in a check so that it, it'll stop if there's an obstacle when it's pulling the doors open. But there might be a few places where I forgot to have laser scanner checking. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think, I don't see any more questions. So... Oh, 400 pounds. If it would hurt. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'd like to thank Tony for an excellent talk. Thank you. Some excellent research. And with that, I'm going to start wrapping the meeting up. I just want to remind people about Cal Games coming up. What was the date again? October 5th. October 5th. Not so this week, but the next one. Next one. And then uh, next month will be our robot challenge. And uh, please bring what you got. <laughs>